Good. good singing. Please be seated. Great singing. That was good. I am. Um, I wanted to say um, Mark and Stacy Clark are here today, and uh, Mark will be going off to uh, this this coming Wednesday. I think this this week, uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. They, move, they go to Cleveland, where Mark is going to be one of the five uh, leaders of our United Church of Christ, where he's going to be one of the five members of the Collegium uh, that, that uh, leads the, the national church. And Mark, uh, Mark grew up in this church, and uh, he, he says that this is one of the places where he learned uh, God's love, God's justice, God's fairness, God's care and uh, God's call, and Mark is answering God's call. Yesterday, he had a, uh, an ecclesiastical council in uh, Tucson, Arizona, where he's been living, and, um, and the, the council voted unanimously to commission him for this ministry, and so he's been called by the National Church, commissioned by uh, the uh, uh, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, uh, Southwest Conference of the United Church of Christ, and off they go. And, and we promised when we voted for him yesterday that uh, we would also pray for him. And so I would like to take just one moment now to, to do that. Thank you, God, for your servants, all of them in this place. Thank you for everyone in this place who has ever heard your call and answered it. Thank you for today, especially for Mark Clark. We thank you for your servant who is answering your call to a very tough position and a very tough time. We ask that you will be with him, that you will minister to him as he ministers to us. Give him the gifts of your uh, spirit, of the mind of Christ, and of your great love as he does the difficult job that he needs to do for us in the National Church. Bless Mark, bless Stacy, bless uh, Mark's family here who will be missing him, you know, Betty and Chris and Carol who are among us and, and the family who is uh, uh, in Mesa. We ask that you would love, show your love to all of them and uh, keep Mark in your love and care and all these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Also, uh, today I want to uh, thank Richard Simon for his work in, uh, he's been being the head usher for a long time, and he's done a really fine job, and he's now turned this over to Todd Gendrick. And I want to say a personal thank you to you, Richard, and I know that I speak for the whole congregation. It's not something we take notice of every Sunday, but without the ushering tasks being done, uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have organized worship. And you've done a superb job of this. And we are uh, extremely grateful for, for your service. And thank, we say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm now going to read to you from the letter to the Philippians. Paul is in prison, and he is uh, under house arrest, okay? And he's awaiting trial, and this trial will end up in his death sentence. He knows that could happen, but this entire letter is full of joy and encouragement and all these good things. It's amazing what a person of faith can do even under pressure. You know? He says, so he's saying to the church now, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way up to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Put yourself aside 
and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand to somebody else. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of, of that no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside all the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. Became fully human. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lives a selfless, obedient life. And then he dies a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death of that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone, anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven on earth and even those long dead and buried will bow before this Jesus and call out in praise that he is the master, the Lord of all, to the glorious honor of God. What I'm getting at, friends, is this, that you should simply keep on doing what you've been doing from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy in you is God's energy, an energy deep within you, God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. In you, in you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, mother of us all, we pray. Amen. St. Paul uh, says to the Philippian church that if they're going to be a Christian church, they need to have the mind of Christ. They need to think, they need to think like Jesus thinks. They need to feel about people and the creation the way Jesus feels about people and the creation. He even says we have to act like Jesus acts, even if it leads us into danger or death. He quotes an early Christian country western song <laughs> about how Jesus comes from God, but how unlike Caesar, who also claims to come from God, and that's what the Philippians are used to, hearing Caesar claim all these titles, Jesus doesn't grasp at that. He doesn't insist on living in a palace. He doesn't have any wealth. He doesn't, he doesn't want to be treated like a king. And in this country western song, Jesus instead takes on the role of a servant or a slave. Do you know that in all the historical material that we have, all of it about the ancient world, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the uh, Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire, there is not one reference, not one, until Jesus, of a superior washing the feet of his servants. Not one. And Paul sings that 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 even as Jesus goes to death in his work for inclusion and justice, even death on a cross, he does this as a servant. Therefore, even though Jesus won't elevate himself, God elevates him, says this country western song, to the title of Lord. The status that Caesar claimed for himself. Every Roman citizen had to go once a year and burn salt on the altar and say out loud, Caesar is Lord. And those who followed Jesus started saying, we can't do that anymore. We, have, we believe Jesus is Lord because service is the way. God calls Jesus Lord because he loves and he serves others. First, and he includes all people. 
And in that, he looks like the God who sends rain and sunshine on everyone in the world. <coughs> Paul concludes that song <coughs> and says that we can only imitate Christ. You can't just do it because we want to. It says we can only do it because God's energy, God's spirit, is within us. God's spirit is inside us to change us and transform us and help us to be everything that we're called to be. I, but I, gotta ask, I, I have to ask for that help. I, I really can't do that on my own. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ in us as individuals and together as the church. What does that look like? What does it look like to have Christ's mind in my, my mind? Well, Jesus is in the temple for the second time in a week. The first time this week, he had tipped over the tables of those changing money from Roman coins into temple script. The Roman coin had Caesar's picture on the front, and it said Caesar divinus, Caesar as God. So for the Jews, the coin was both an idol and blasphemy. And so it couldn't go into the temple. Uh, and so, so you couldn't use it for your offerings. The temple script was something like chips used at blackjack or a poker game. Some of you would know what that looks like. Um, um, but there was, but there, was no, there was no picture on it. Apparently, like the commodities or stock markets, or the currency exchanges, people would noisily bark for the best exchange rates in the temple. The noise would overpower prayer. But it wasn't as noisy as the people selling animals for religious sacrifice, mostly sheep and goats and birds. The animals going to sacrifice were noisy too, not going gently into that dark night. <laughs> the only two possible places in the temple for sales activity to be going on would be the two outer areas that had been traditionally set aside, one for women and the other for Gentiles to worship. Non-Jews and women were not entered, and were not permitted to enter in the inner court near the altar, lest they contaminate the sacrifice of the chosen men, don't you know? So Jesus, the rabbi, with, with both women and men followers, and who heals and converses with Gentiles, is upset as he enters this temple. Not only at the noise of the stock exchange, slaughterhouse, interfering with the prayers, but that these women and foreigners are excluded from God's presence. Jesus did not win friends, or influence people among the sellers, changes, or the clergy. That was Monday. It's only Wednesday. <laughs> and in today's gospel, some of the leaders are trying to entrap Jesus by getting him to respond to their question in a self-incriminating way. By what authority do you teach these things? Who's your teacher? What's your seminary? Where, uh, where, who is the, the God that you're speaking for? Inquiring minds want to know. Why, when Jesus speaks about God, why doesn't he follow every thought with a footnote? Quoting what somebody else thinks about God. Instead, they say that the people love Jesus because they say he speaks as one with inner authority. Jesus would say, this is what God is like. This is what the realm or the kingdom or the kingdom of heaven on this earth is like. Remember that for Jesus, the kingdom is not some faraway place. It's here. When Jews said the word heaven in this context, the kingdom of heaven, they're substituting the word heaven for God. Jews didn't speak the word God aloud or the name of God, Yahweh, aloud. It was too holy. So they would say heaven instead. People still make that switch. 
My mom used to make that switch. Some of you remember Edna. Edna would never say, for God's sake. She just wouldn't, you know. But she would say, for heaven's sake, Stephen Edward Wales, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 you know, and it would be. And, and, but for heaven's sake, and that's the same way that the Jews, Matthew's gospel always talks about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of heaven is here. Without being arrogant about it, but with great confidence, Jesus talks about the reign of God and about God's relationship as, as if he himself has an actual relationship with God. Jesus tells stories, an intimate relationship. Jesus tells stories that invite the listener to imagine that he or she actually has, that you have an intimate relationship with God. Jesus makes relationship with God to be less about what you believe about God and more about your trusting in God. It's about a way of being and, a, and about a way of loving and a way of living and behaving with others. He made it more about the way you treat people and not about rule keeping or a way of living in which you isolate yourself from certain people, keeping yourself pure by staying away from this kind of person or that kind of person. Religious folk were worrying about with whom they might be associated because, you know, birds of a feather and, and one rotten apple and, uh, and, and all that. For Jesus, demonstrating that you are a person of faith is less about your professing a belief in orthodox doctrines about God or about believing in the past miracles of, that God has accomplished and more about your listening to what is God calling you to do in this moment? What is God calling you to be in this moment? And then doing it, as we heard in the, the gospel. To this day, in many churches, what is being taught is that what God wants for you to be is associating with the right kind of people. Those who observe the rules and rituals as we do. And to be avoiding those unclean and unsavory folks that will taint you with the sin of the world. Well, whatever that is, it isn't following Jesus. Jesus gets criticized because people don't, he doesn't expect his disciples, his students, his followers, to go through all those customary ritual washings, as if the people in the marketplace all had some sort of sin cooties, you know, <laughs> that one could catch which, of course, are supposed to make one unclean and unacceptable to God. Jesus is a very observant Jew who opposes scrupulous observance of the rules for their own sake. You don't just do rules for rules. You know how some actors can say the words, but there's no feeling? You know how some violinists can hit all the right notes, but there's no music, no soul? No heart to the thing. For Jesus, religion and spirituality are really more a relationship and an art than a set of doctrines, dogmas, and propositions of believing ten impossible things before breakfast. Right? These folks who hold the religious power and who are allowed to hold power by being in collusion with the Romans who run everything, want to know, by what authority, Jesus, by what right do you tip over tables? What right do you have to talk about God? Not only from scripture, but from your experience. And further, what gives Jesus the right to break the rules and to eat with the prostitutes and the tax collectors? and the other so-called sinners. And then, without washing himself, sitting down with the good people, like themselves, and putting his hand in the same dish with them. By what authority, they want to know. As a rabbi, what gives you the right to hang out with those people? Recently, two other Christian denominations have voted to change their rules and so begin to do what our United Church of Christ began in 1971. 
in ordaining gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender persons to the ministry. Okay. But, but some of the biggest churches of both of those denominations, including some here in the Valley, already have or are talking about pulling themselves out of those denominations rather than accepting people like that. People like many of us here. That happened in the United Church of Christ, too, in 1971. We lost several churches who decided that if in this branch of the church Jesus is associating with people like that, they'd find a branch of the church where Jesus showed more discrimination. <laughs> they said everyone is in God's image. However, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people are not welcome here unless they repent of who they are. Can you imagine Jesus? I ask you, can you imagine Jesus saying anything like that? Jesus doesn't dignify their question. Instead, he responds with a question to his questioners. By what authority did John the Baptist do his work? Was he doing his work for God or not? And remember, this questioning of Jesus is happening in public. Now that he's turned the tables, those critics certainly don't want to be in an argument about John, whom all the people were certain was from God and who had convinced so many people to prepare this world for God's kingdom and reign. So the critics don't answer. These strict literalist, legalist people love to hold everyone in the temple hostage to their narrow beliefs and their rigid rules for doing things. And that's how they exclude all kinds of people. It's no fun being up here if there's nobody down there. Right? The very people Jesus is calling to himself. Jesus tells these literalist legalists a parable. The parable that we heard this morning. A father tells his two sons, go into the vineyard and do some work. One says, sure, daddy, just to get daddy off his back. But he doesn't go. And the other child says, never. And then he thinks about it, and he goes. Which child obeys? The one who said no, but went, they, re they respond. And Jesus says to these people, you heard John the Baptist calling for turning your life around, repentance, and going in God's new direction, where instead of you uh, in charge, or Caesar in charge, or Herod in charge, that God is in charge. And you, who say you're God's people and God's leaders, didn't pay any attention to John. Your status is so completely dependent on your connection to Caesar and Herod that you're afraid without Caesar and Herod you'll be nothing. So you decided not to listen to God's message from John. And Rome and Herod killed John. But those prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners did believe him and even though they said they'd never follow God's way, they did. And they went under the waters and they're going already into God's realm. Before you religious leaders. That didn't go over real well. <laughs> that didn't go over real well. You know in your heart it can only be a chapter or two away before Jesus will end up crucified. In fact, this is Wednesday of Holy Week, so it's two days. Jesus has been accused of supporting bad behavior because he welcomes, even invites, prostitutes, tax collectors, those collecting for the Roman occupation, and other known sinners. He tells people, and then he himself acts as if outward, opinion, outward appearances and the people that you associate with don't matter. That's not, that's not what God is interested in. God is interested in loving all people. The in-crowd of pro uh, propriety and religious orthodoxy want to know what gives Jesus the right to challenge the conventional religious teaching that if you just keep yourself pure from the dirt of the world and the most sinful people, and if you obey the 613 commandments, then you're doing all God wants. Father Paul O'Reilly uh, is a British MD and Jesuit priest. He recounts the story of a young Australian woman who was, who was traveling around India. And she's walking through the streets in Calcutta, and she comes across a small boy 
who looks about five years old and has apparently been beaten, and he's been left to die in the street. And now he's covered with sores and bites and bruises, but he's still alive. And she doesn't know what to do, but she can't bear to leave him there, and she's heard about Mother Teresa's hospital. So she brings him to the hospice in Calcutta, and she asks if she can bring the child into the house. But then, after bringing him there, she sees how overworked everybody is, and she can't bear to leave the child there and, and just go away. So she asks if she can stay and help you know, with the care of this one child. And so she does, and she nurses the child day and night, and after about a week, the child starts to improve, and she begins to help with nursing and some of the other sick people in the hospice. And after about a month of this, Mother Teresa asks whether she's ever considered entering religious life. The woman is very moved and flattered by the offer because she knows it's very unusual for Mother Teresa to ask people to join her congregation. But she said, well, you see, actually, I'm not even a religious person. Uh, both of my parents are atheists. I've never been into a church in my life. I've never been baptized. I'm not sure I'm the sort of person that you would want as a nun. And Mother Teresa said, don't worry about that. When the actions are there, the words will follow. She was like the child who had said no, but went into the vineyard and did, did the deed, did the work, did the the loving of God, you know. Jesus tells his detractors, it's not your words you say or the promises you make that matter. It's whether you're following the path of Jesus' love and service in your life. Now, I'm glad we are all in church. That's where we belong. And I'm glad that you believe the important things you believe. But what, what we are about, and, and when all is said and done, is doing, is doing what Jesus did. And that is incarnating God into the world. That's our job. We do what we're called to do. Bring God's love and God's heart with God's energy into the world, whether we feel like it or whether we don't. And whether we first say we're not going to do it or co and come to have a change of heart, as the little boy said this morning. Change of heart. As Mother Teresa said, if the actions of our lives reveal the power of God working in us, the words will follow. That's all well and good, but I can't do it on my own. I really can't. I need God's help. I need practice. And the fact is that you can't do it on your own either, and you need help, and you need practice too. Right? That's what Sue is talking about this morning, I think, in that... You know, and practicing this. And none of us is going to get it perfectly. So, the church is here for us as a lab. This is where we do Jesus' lab. The laboratory. Community. Where we get to practice with one another a way of living that is very much contrary to the me first, get ahead any way I can, my way or the highway, path of the empire that is out there. What we're trying to do here is different. That was true in the first century as it is right now. Paul loves that church at Philippi. He writes them from the Roman house where he's being held under house arrest. There are all kinds of forces in, the, in these church folks that they face every day that threaten their faith. There are all sorts of challenges within this young church. The empire way of handling them would be to squash the opposition. St. Paul says, don't do it that way. He gives them a checklist of benefits of following Jesus. It's the same one he gives to us. If you've gotten anything out of following Christ, he says. Now, have you gotten anything out of following Christ? Is there anything? He said, if his love has made any difference in your life, has the love of Jesus made any difference for you? Has it made any difference for me? If being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, has being a part of a community of the Spirit meant anything to you? If you have a heart, he says, if you have a heart, do you, do you and I have any compassion for others that we've learned 
since we've been on this path? If you care, he says, do you and I have empathy or sympathy for other people because we've been here? Then Paul says, do me a favor. If any of these things are true, do me a favor. And since you've received all of this in Christ, then pass it along within the church. And how do we do that? He says, we'll agree with each other. Now, you know, we are congregational UCC folks. We're not going to agree on everything. That's not going to be the case. But agreeing means rather than constantly picking at one another and pointing out the differences of opinion, to try to look for the common ground that we share with one another and the goals for the better community and the better world that, that you hold in common. Let's build on those. That's what Paul is saying. Don't, don't focus on what's wrong with this picture. And second, he said, love each other. If this is true, then love each other. And what does that mean? That means my willing the best for you and you're willing the best for me and, and all of us then acting on that goodwill you know, toward one another. Uh, be deep-spirited friends, he says. Be deep, deep spiritual friends. You know, we recognize here that every one of us is a brother or sister in Christ. Whether we like each other or whether we don't. I mean, sometimes you like your brothers and sisters and sometimes you don't. But, but this, is about the, this is about that deep spiritual thing. Don't push your way to the front of the line, he says. Don't sweet talk or flatter your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Get outside yourself. If you're feeling bad about something, what's the best thing to do? Do something with somebody else. It's, I mean, that's, it, it, I have to get outside of me. Help others to get ahead, he says. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to give a helping hand. Brett Younger says that the difference between talking about the Christian faith and, and living like Jesus is the difference between reading the sheet, sheet music and singing the song. You know? Are you going to just read the music? Are you going to sing the song? Everybody knows my mom. Uh, I keep talking about her. It's, been, it's, it's still this first year. It's still so hard not to have her around. But everybody who knew, knew her knew she loved to read cookbooks. But nobody got invited to her house for dinner because she hated to cook. <laughs> you know? Reading the cookbook and eating a meal are not the same thing. Uh, Dr. Will Willimon is the Methodist Bishop of Alabama. He says that one church that was meeting uh, in a school cafeteria that he knows gave away all of its hard-earned building fund to a family with six adopted foster children with severe de developmental needs. The members said to this family, God wouldn't want us to build God's house before we built your house. These kids need something, you know. Uh, Jesus has odd ideas about success, you know. Willimon says that on one of the worst and most grueling days of his life as a bishop, he was ready to go home from the office when he was informed that he had one more appointment, and he groaned. Two older women walked into the office. One said, we've come to Birmingham from Pullman to tell you about our ministry. Gladys's grandson was busted with a DUI. We went over to the youth prison camp to visit him there. Sad to say, we had never been there before. We were appalled at the conditions that we found there. Those young men were packed in there like animals. We got to know them by name. Are you aware that only 10% of those boys over there can read? an illiterate 19-year-old, and we wonder why they're in prison? The other one said, well, we began reading classes. Sarah taught school before she retired, and then that led to a Bible study group in the evening. We're up to three Bible study groups a week. Two of our friends from the church can't get out, so they bake cookies. We've also enlisted two wonderful nurses who helped with the VD problem over there. Some of them said, some of the boys said, that these cookies are the first gifts they ever received in their life. Willimon said, I asked with bureaucratic indifference 
And so you want the conference to take responsibility for this ministry. Sarah responded, no, we don't want it to get messed up. <laughs> Amen. So, so he said, so, so you need me to come up with some money for you? We don't need any money. If we needed something, we just ask the people in our little church, and they always come through. Willimon asks, so why did you come here? What do you want? Well, we know, they said, that being a bishop must be one of the most depressing jobs in the world. Too many things that we're not doing that Jesus expects us to do. So Gladys thought it would be nice if we came down here to tell you to take heart and that something's going right up in Coleman. And Willimon said, that's what Jesus is trying to encourage us to do. I have to have the mind of Jesus to do that. And a heart of Jesus to do that. But then I have to have the inspiration, the power of God's Holy Spirit, the energy to get me off my duff and to get me out of the way of the empire's way so that I can do the things for the people who will never be able to pay me back. That I can help them so that they can do the things for which people will never be able to pay them back. Because that's how the mission of Christ moves forward. I have to incarnate God in me so that you get to incarnate God in you and you pass it along. May God bless us as we seek to be the church where God is incarnate in every one of us and where the whole world feels the difference.